how to invest in value stocks at a discount price that is not available to retail investors and get paid even if your market order doesn't go through. In this episode of the Investiva Movement, we're going to talk about an investment strategy that not many investors know about. And if too many investors find out about it, it might actually stop working. So I actually kind of don't want this video to go viral, but my team was able to book Matthew Peterson, managing partner at Peterson and capital management for today's episode to talk about the special value investing method. This video is full of nuggets of wisdom, so grab your coffee, a pen and paper to take notes. I'm your host, Kiana Danielle, a four-time and a best-selling author and the founder of the Invest Diva movement, the march to jump on to take control of your financial future and to make your money work for you. Our mission is to help one million moms start investing on their own, so if you are a parent or if you know of a mom who could benefit from taking control of her financial future, to create generational wealth, please spread the word. The best place to start is learn.investiva.com forward slash yes. Now let's go say hi to Matthew Peterson. Welcome, Matthew. We're so we're excited to have you on the Investiva movement. You have a fascinating story, a very unique approach to investing that almost nobody is doing. And I cannot wait to get down to the T. I really want to get as much secret as possible from you. You guys watching at home, just get your, grab your notes and start taking notes. Matthew, welcome. Thank you, Kiana. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are focused on concentrated value investing. So walk us through it and tell us what it is exactly that your fund is focusing right now. Okay, that's a great question. So I run a long-term value fund. So it ends up being very concentrated on a number of, uh, we look at a number of parameters and in fact, I think there's a very good framework to keep in mind that a lot of value fund managers will kind of be focused on. And that framework is, I call it our co-priorities framework. And we're focused on kind of the greatest business models and the absolute greatest managers or CEOs of the businesses. And then the, the best value that we can find. And if you put all their co-priorities sort of together, it, um, it leads you down to a very concentrated portfolio because there just aren't that many um, great businesses and managers at a great price. Okay. That is like, oh my God, tell me what it is. What are those for? So what are these values that are you looking for? What is it? What are we looking at? Uh, well, okay. So we, we run such a concert portfolio. Um, and the, the firms that we're looking at are, are often very niche sort of companies. So they may or may not be of interest to your audience, um, but but I can list out a few and you can sort of follow the breadcrumbs. It's like, um, you know, Warren Buffett's one of the, uh, you know, greatest investors of all time. Uh, he has a partner, Charlie Munger. And a lot of people don't realize that Charlie Munger runs a little micro cap tech firm uh, called Daily Journal. And they do uh, SaaS software implementation for courthouses. Um, they're only about 285 million market cap with uh, another equity portfolio, and they're probably going to grow very large. So we um, we find these types of businesses that are wonderful business models that are misunderstood by the market, that are run by extraordinary people, and uh, and we hold on to those for the long term. I always was under the impression that value investing is investing in companies that are actually larger cap, but you look at the right price for it. So you look for the price or the, the, stock, the, the shares to drop and then buy. Is yeah. that a misunderstanding no, about value investing? That's a common misconception. So really what value investing means is buying a firm at a discount to its intrinsic value. And the best way to understand the intrinsic value of a business or one of a couple of ways is to take a discount of the free cash flow that will be available to the shareholders over the life time of the business. So you go out, you know, uh, 100 years and you discount all the cash flow back to the day and you say, well, this is how much it's worth. And if the market is offering you that business at, you know, a 50% or 
80% discount to that price, that becomes a really strong opportunity because when the market wakes up and recognizes that maybe cash flows are going to grow or things are going to happen differently, uh, the price then rises. So, uh, and to add to that, Kiana, there's two sort of key methods of value investing. There's the Ben Graham method, which is the, um, the old school, like, cigar butt method, they call it. So you buy at a discount to a business, but it's not necessarily growing. Um, it can be like a kind of a crummy business that uh, might even be dying, but you get such a great deal that you buy it. And then when it appreciates a little bit, you sell it, you flip it, you trade it to find something else. And then there's the Phil Fisher kind of opportunities. And Phil Fisher is like the garb, like growth at a reasonable price. So you figure out a company that's actually growing and you get to stick with that company for a really long period of time. And for a number of reasons, that's the preferred methodology. And so I really like very small companies because very small companies can grow into very large companies. Well, that's true. So for example, uh, well, yeah, because the, the scaling opportunity is much bigger. So that kind of makes sense. But then the question comes, how do you even find these companies? Is it because you're uh, friends with Warren Buffett or are you just? <laughs> well, no, that's, a, that's another great question. Uh, how do you find these companies? So I have a very specific process that we use. Um, a lot of your viewers can find a similar process. There are amazing shortcuts that a lot of professionals uh, won't do because they want to be creative or they want to, uh, or, 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 or they just, um, or they won't admit it. But uh, the SEC actually requires funds larger than 100 million to post their holdings in a 13 app every quarter. And so if you're looking at high frequency trading or you're flipping shares, it's not gonna be of any value because it comes 45 days after the quarter ends and then you post your 13 app. But if you're watching you know, Bill Ackman and David Einhorn and, and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, Seth Klarman, they're spending billions putting billions into a company, they've done, you know, hundreds, thousands of hours of research, maybe spent millions in doing that research. They also run concentrated por portfolios, so maybe they have 10 positions, and they turn around and say with conviction, I'm gonna buy this, and usually they're buying for maybe five or 10 years. That is a really nice thing to know, you know? So uh, you can go to the SEC's website and look up any fund and you can see what their holdings are and you can see how they change quarter over quarter. So if you see that one of these uh, super investors uh, are sort of piling into a new opportunity, it might be worth digging deeper. And that's, that's the starting point for a lot of our research. Uh, we only need sort of one or two, you know, four of our positions make up over 50% and we'll probably hold them this entire decade. So it's not like we're turning things. It's not like we need a new idea every week. Uh, but we're looking for that like secret gem that we find where there's a, uh, a extraordinary business model, extraordinary management, and then you get a good price for it. This is very interesting, but my question is, all right, how come the media isn't going after those things and how come they're not, not hyping up the, um, the assets that the powerhouses are buying, but instead they're hyping up, you know, the stocks like Tesla and all the other like Nvidia, which I actually like, I, I believe in those companies, but obviously those are yeah. not, I've talked to a number of fund managers. They actually do not, they refuse to include these, types of stocks in, in their funds. So why isn't the media take note of this? Well, uh, so there's a few reasons. I don't want to get myself in trouble here. I spent a lot of my, my I spent a bunch of years in New York at uh, Goldman doing risk management work. And um, part of it, honestly, from a media perspective is because it's not really that sexy, you know, to just kind of get like, Exactly. Oh, I'm going to get 15% annually for the next 10 years and, and uh, just pay attention to like cash flows and EBITDA. It's just not fun, right? So everybody wants to know, oh, what, what Tesla do today? What's going on with Amazon? What's happening here? And that's fun. Plus, it's fun stuff, right? Oh, are we going to get this rocket going to go off? If you're talking about, you know, I'm telling you daily journals are good value, uh, they do 
uh, software solutions for courthouses. I mean, that's there's nothing more boring than that. There's like very little competition. Anybody who graduates with a degree in computer science, you know, there's a million places they could go. They don't think of Daily Journal. Uh, so it's just not. Uh, it's just not. It's going to draw the eyeballs. Um, let me let me stop you here and talk to the audience for a second. You guys, that's the reason why. Precisely, if you go to my YouTube channel, I've been testing out. I've been testing boring stocks, and I've been testing Tesla and Apple and all the sexy stuff. They get the most views. So guess which video I'm going to publish publicly? The one that gets me the most views. I just gave you away my secret. And Matthew here just admits that, but I'm an open book. That's the reason why I choose these stocks. And the interesting yeah. thing is people know about me, find out about me through one of these videos and they come to my world. They're like, okay, tell me when to went buy Tesla. I'm like, uh, well, actually, I don't have any shares of Tesla right now. I'm looking at this stuff and I'm like, what? Tell me about Tesla. Why did you have a Tesla on your YouTube channel? I was like, well, because it gets more clicks. That is so right. <laughs> Yeah, can I, can I share something with you actually? So because we're talking about Tesla and Tesla gets people's interest, um, we are in, I, I just, I think your viewers will appreciate this. We are in such an extraordinary time. It's like the largest probably transfer of wealth in our, in our lives right now. And uh, we in fact just have in, in March, um, the VIX, which is the volatility index, just broke all time records. That's the fear index. So we are like at record fear. We just broke the fear index. We're at record fear. And, and a lot of people know rationally, be greedy when others are fearful, right? And so during this time of like maximum fear where everyone's locked up, we have social unrest, everyone's, you know, there's a pandemic going on, there's a recession happening. It's just so chaotic. There's so much uncertainty. It's like the ideal environment to get hyper rational and allocate to really good businesses that are cheap. Because if you look through this crisis and you're like in 2020, late 2021, maybe 2022, I think people will look back at today and just think, wow, that was just an extraordinary time to put money to work to buy these great businesses. And so with that in mind, Tesla, okay? You, you mentioned Tesla gets a lot of clicks, so we can bring up Tesla. I wanna share with you because uncertainty is so high, the way that we buy our securities is really a unique, we have a really unique approach and anybody can do this. It's just, you're, it's, it comes in multiples of a hundred shares. Um, Instead of buying our stock through the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, like any retail investor would with like a limit or market order, uh, we actually don't do that at all. We go through the Chicago Board of Exchange and we write a contract called a put. And it's important that you kind of do some research and learn about these a little bit. If you want to try it, try it with one kind of thing. But it's so fascinating because when you write a put, you're basically insuring somebody else that you'll buy the shares from them. So we write cash secured puts, for example. So this, it's best explained as an example. So let's take Tesla. Tesla post split, I think is around $400 a share, okay? So you can go and buy it for $400 a share in the market, or, and because volatility is so high, this is happening as, this is the price I just checked. You go to Chicago Board, you can do it through your Schwab account, Ameritrade or whatever, it just gets routed through the Chicago Board Exchange and you write a put committing to buying it for 400. So instead of buying it for 400, you just commit to buying it for 400. If you make that commitment out till January of 2022, okay, so we're in the almost Q4 2020, so you're going out 15 months, you get paid $175 for the commitment to buying it for 400, which means if the shares dip and they put it into your portfolio, you keep their, you keep your counterparts capital, it costs you $225 to buy the stock instead of 400. So basically when volatility is high and we've just broken the record volatility, and by the way, volatility of volatility is very high. So volatility gets high and low and high. When that happens, 
and you get high volatility, you get really high premiums. And so instead of buying through the New York Stock Exchange, you just sell a put. And, in, and now instead of buying Tesla for 400, you can actually just buy it for 225. So this is kind of like uh, setting a buy limit order through your exchange, but also getting paid for it. That's right. It's actually it, 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 a two-step well, process. Yeah. Right. It's a two-step process, and it's kind of like options trading. It's not. Tr uh, I think there's danger in trading. Thing. Yeah. Um, what it is, but it is using those products. It's just using them differently. It's sort of similar to like buying a pork belly future, but instead of having a cash delivery, you're like, no, I want my pork. Okay, so I'm up, you're, you go out and you write a put contract, one contract, one time, and then you just sit and wait. And you want them to then put the shares in your portfolio. You'll give them 400 in the case of Tesla, but 175 of it is their money in the first place. And so you end up getting in with a, with a cost basis of $225 for Tesla, which is trading at 400. You turn around, sell the market for 400. So let me see if I got your process right. You first go and find all these powerhouses funds and see what they are holding in their funds. Mm -hmm. You select the best of the best. Then you go to Chicago Mercantile Exchange, buy a put, so and a get your money and run with it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. I mean, there's... There's a lot of nuances um, that go along with it, but um, for your viewers, they can follow that process. They're going to do pretty well. Um, if you're following 13F, you know, there's maybe 10,000 securities that people can search for. It's really hard to find that needle in a haystack. Markets are pretty efficient, right? The efficient market hypothesis is relatively true. In practice, we do get swings around the actual price. Um, so if, you know, but if you're looking at these 13 apps, you might narrow down 10,000 to like 50 securities that are really interesting. And now you get to go and pick your very favorite. And then yes, um, fundamental analysis is a big part of step two, but step three is how do you buy it? And, uh, and certainly um, since 2005, when I discovered that this method will work, I, I would never buy it through the traditional exchange. It doesn't make any sense to me because somebody will pay me. If I wanted to buy it sooner, um, you could go look right now and you'd probably get paid, I don't know what, but maybe $20, $30 um, just for like mid-September contract. So why buy it for 400 if you can get it for 370 in a week? So what happens if everybody does this? Uh, then the prices will stop being so irrational. And, uh, and I used to be very afraid of that. Kiana, I don't actually talk about this very often uh, because I actually used to never talk about it. And then I started to talk about it a little bit and I realized that only the very few smartest people in a massive audience would go out and do it. So I realized I can be comfortable explaining it. It's just a it is, it's kind of out of your comfort zone because you're telling me this right now and I'm just used to my own investment strategy is my bread and butter. I have my own process. So it definitely is very hard to just break out of the strategy that you feel is working for you to go and use a different strategy. And the reason why I'm super excited to share this with my audience is that you guys, that there are so many different strategies that actually work. And the strategy that Matthew is presenting to you is obviously something that not many people are talking about. And if you were looking to change your strategy, I, I'm going to look into this uh, myself as well. It's something to consider because at the end of the day, you know, you want to have the strategies that are suitable to your unique risk tolerance, to the time that you want to put into this. If you're willing to take more risk, then by all means, go ahead and do other types of investments or trading. So I, I'm just, in my opinion, what Matthew is presenting right now kind of falls into a portfolio of somebody who is medium to lower risk, who has a medium to low risk tolerance. Am I correct? 
Uh, well, it depends on how you classify risk, but I would say that that's uh, I would say that that's accurate. Basically, uh, if you look at it at the simplest fundamental level, what you're doing is you're lowering your purchase price. So uh, instead of paying 400 for Tesla, uh, if you're willing to wait for a little more than a year, you can get in at 225. Uh, to me, that lowers your risk because if the shares fall to 200, instead of losing 50%, now you're down just 10%, that little sliver. So uh, you, you build in a margin of safety by doing this. So uh, I find it, I don't personally uh, classify risk as volatility as they often do in academia. I look at risk as the probability of the permanent loss of capital. And, uh, and this reduces uh, the probability of a loss in capital because you're sending out less. Right, so actually, let me clarify this. Uh, if the put, not the, the price that you put for the put, the, the price that you commit to doesn't go through, you still get paid. Correct. Right? That's, That's the, the beauty of it. Yeah. That is the beauty of it. Yeah. Um, there are a number of firms out there. I won't, I don't think we have time to go into detail, but um, particularly volatile firms. So uh, you can look through your own portfolio. You can look at firms that you liked and loved for years. And what happens is if a company, let's say ABC firm just went to $100 and it drops to 50, that's when those premiums actually gross to this type of level. And that's why right now is the, is the opportunity. So this isn't a lifelong shift in strategy. This is me just uh, showing you that right now, because we are in a unprecedented crisis, uncertainty, breaking records, people are willing to pay huge amounts. Volatility is one of the factors in the Black Shoals. Black Shoals is used to price these contracts. So when volatility goes up, the price of these contracts goes up. So for example, we're buying into one firm. It's worth about 40. Uh, it's selling for 15. We're committing to, to buying it for 14. We're getting paid $4 for that. They go out eight months. So we're making $4 on 10 in collateral, which is 40% over eight months, and we probably will not buy the shares. These are nuggets of wisdom, you guys. Thank you so much, Matthew, for sharing. And now I, I'm going to ask you a bunch of fast questions because people are like, okay, how did you come up with this? Tell us a little bit about how you got started in investing and how you found this specific method. Fine. Uh, well, uh, I'll make it brief, but uh, I, you know, I've, I've always been passionate about this stuff. Like since I was a child, I was doing strange um, things, trading bank CDs and things like while my parents were at work. So uh, I've always been passionate about it. I, got, I studied economics and math. Uh, I, I, Went out to Wall Street um, in, I've been for investing professionally for two decades. So this is kind of my third crisis. There's a lot of like major crises. You know, you have the dot-com collapse and 9-11, and then you have, you know, financial crisis, and now you have this. And there's a lot of similarities. But um, so I went out to Wall Street right after 9-11, uh, uh, started working in risk management at Goldman, um, doing consulting for Goldman and a few other banks. I spent a couple of years in London. Uh, building out this calculator and uh, always with the intention of putting uh, my fund together. And then in 2000 and, uh, 2010, uh, moved out to Los Angeles and, uh, and launched Peterson Capital Management. And, um, and so- uh, It's the same time I went to Wall Street, 2010. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, so, uh, yeah. Really high level overview. So I know that your wife uh, actually is from Turkey and she uh, studied Japanese teaching. Uh, in, in, That's in correct. You've done your homework. That is correct. <laughs> so uh, I share something with your, uh, with your wife over there. Absolutely. Yeah. She lived in Japan too. I know that you lived there for a while and maybe went to university. Yeah. 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 I lived there for seven years. Yeah. Japan's wonderful. I've been Absolutely. there a few times. She was there. We've kind of, we, we have a little bit of an international life. I think you probably do as well. Yes, yeah, my husband is Australian. I'm from Iran, lived in Japan. We live in Connecticut. It's just like all over the place. I'm like, That's what right. am I? Like my daughter is gonna get super confused. Matthew, before I let you go, 
and when we were chatting before the, the podcast, you said that you have a tip for our viewers because you know that my goal is to help 1 million moms start yeah. investing on their own. So I'm obviously super curious to know what this tip is. I, I do. It, when I saw that, uh, I realized there's, there's something, I, I've done this, uh, people don't know that most people have never really thought about this, um, but I think it's probably the greatest gift you could give your child financially. Uh, so how to help a million moms? Well, okay, so let's assume that everyone understands um, IRAs, Roth IRAs, right? Roth IRAs, you know, you, you put in capital post-tax and now it grows and it's never taxed again. Um, I guess for this to work, you sort of need to have a uh, business of some kind or access to some LLC or something of that nature. Uh, but the idea basically is um, help your child to have some income at a very early age. So for us, uh, my wife had an import-export business, and um, we hired some models for doing some modeling work, and we also hired our children to be models, uh, and we gave them $6,000 for their modeling work, and then we funded their minor Roth IRAs, okay? So $6,000 goes into the minor Roth IRA. We did this when they were one. Uh, if Roth IRA, you know, that it's never taxed again, and, uh, and it has all sorts of benefits. If that compounds at 10% for their life, uh, if, it, if they need it, let's say there's a special rule of 72. So if you go out to when they're 72 and they've earned 10% a year, it actually becomes $5 million. So uh, you're able to basically uh, sort of set them up with a $5 million tax-free account at retirement uh, when they're very, very young. It can also be used for medical emergencies and down payment on a first home or even educational purposes. Uh, but it does something else that's really subtle, which I think is so important is it teaches them psychologically about the value of compounding. So when they're 10 or 15, it won't grow maybe enough to, to completely spoil them. Uh, but when they're 25, 30, they'll start to recognize that their account's really growing. And uh, oftentimes it takes a lot of years for people to really understand the true value of compounding. I think this helps them learn it at a very young age. So um, I highly recommend doing that for, uh, for anybody who's, who's young in their life. Thank you so much, Matthew, for sharing that. And that is absolutely correct. Like my passion is to help these moms because they are going to keep set their children up for generational wealth. It's not about just about you, it's also for your children and their children to come. And this is a beautiful thing to start them up early. And what you just pointed out uh, is absolutely correct because it takes years for that Roth IRA to actually have that, the, the, the growth that you can actually see. And you're right, like by the time that they should start looking into their finances, hopefully earlier, but if they have that kind of background, it'll help them to understand the value of it. Um, again, thank you so much, Matthew, thank for you, joining. Mom. This was thank awesome. You. you guys, did you guys, what do you think of Matthew's approach to investing? And are you going to Chicago Mercantile Exchange tomorrow and check this put <laughs> uh, strategy out? Let me know in the comments. I'm super curious to know. And if you're going to do it, which companies are you going to do it for? So let me know in the comments. Again, thank you so much, Matthew, for joining. And you guys remember the only path to true wealth is by making your money work for you. Thank you, Matthew. Before I let you go, we have a tradition in our show. We ask all of our guests to do a silly face. Silly Three, face. two, one. <laughs> okay. You're a pro. You're a pro. <laughs> I have kids too, so... Uh, you have kids, all right. So that's kind of